time to talk about S3 and the amendment that um, we would offer before third reading, I think. Or I guess I would offer. Do you have that? Yeah, yeah, should I pull that one up? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, the, the moment or two of background I'll, I'll sort of mention as I'm bringing the bringing the text up is that uh, as Senator Sears mentioned, this is a an amendment for S3, which is the um, competency to stand trial and Sandy defense bill. And you remember there was discussion uh, in the committee about the the requirements that the the bill has for uh, notification. In particular, there's two different pieces of of notification that are that are in there. Two different stages of the process, really. That that notification kicks in, or two different types of notification. And the uh, you'll recall, I'm sure, that one piece that was really geared toward victim notification in particular required that essentially when when someone who's been committed to DMH custody um, because they've been found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity, the uh, there's notification that's required when essentially when the person's um, status changes. So uh, this is not the amendment right here that I'm talking about. I'm just giving a moment of background. So remember, there's one piece of notification. It's when, when the person who's been committed, say if they are going to be discharged from DMH custody or if they're going to be moved into the community on an order of non-hospitalization uh, or, or as well as if they're uh, uh, absconded from DMH custody, there's notification that's required to the prosecutor, essentially, who then has to pass that that information along to the victim. That's not what this amendment goes to. This is the other type of notification that's required. And this is when a person is already in uh, the community on an order of non-hospitalization. So, so this isn't a, a question of their status changing the way that I've just described the, the victim notification piece working. This is triggered by a different circumstance, which is that the person is in the community on an order of, on an ONH, order of non-hospitalization, but uh, uh, they, they um, either don't comply, they're failing to comply with the ONH in some way, or the alternative treatment that they're getting is not adequate to meet the person's needs. So those are your two sort of triggering events under that notification piece. And if that's the case, then the commissioner of mental health has to, has to notify, um, notify the prosecutor. So the question that came up in the committee was, well, there were a couple of questions. One was, well, how, what, what counts as a triggering event? You know, what would it mean for, for the person either to, to be not, not in compliance or the treatment not, not working to meet their needs? What, what are we talking about for the kinds of events that would constitute that sort of, uh, you know, that would meet that standard and, and then require notification to the prosecutor? And not only that, the next question was, that, and then if, if that did happen, what does the prosecutor do with the information? Um, so those were, I think, the, the main questions the committee had. So uh, the, the thought had been that the committee would ask this, the forensic care working group to look at those two questions. And that's what the amendment does. And that's really the second sentence. So the first sentence just says, OK, the working group that you've already established in the bill has to consider that notification process, which is the one I just described, when the commissioner has to provide notification to the prosecutor. After, after becoming aware that uh, a person in, in the community on an ONH is either not complying with the order or the alternative treatment is not adequate to meet the person's needs. Uh, in that case, the working group is then uh, asked to, uh, or actually required to, shall make any, and then on line 10, any recommendations it deems necessary to clarify the process, including recommendations as to what facts and circumstances should trigger the commissioner's duty to notify the prosecutor. So that's that first piece, what, what's going to require notification. And uh, secondly, any recommendations as to steps that the prosecutor should take after receiving the notification. So that's the gist of it. The only other thing I wanted to point out real quickly is that I know there'd been some talk about 
you know, the language itself, in other words, the, the, the triggering language that the person's either not complying with the order or that alternative treatment is not adequate to meet the person's um, treatment Eric? needs. And I just want to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Now, I just got one more piece I just want to okay. uh, bring to the committee's attention, just in case it, you know, perhaps comes up on the floor as well. Just, and I had mentioned it this last meeting, I just couldn't quite, I didn't have the statute at the tip tip of my tongue. So that language is in the existing ONH statute. If you look at um, the very first sentence under the existing uh, non order of non-hospitalization statute, uh, if the court finds that a treatment program other than hospitalization, that's the ONH, is, in, is that adequate? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed it. It's not an A. It's in B, sorry. Uh, if it's a, if any time during the specified period, so that's in other words, it's when the person is on the O and H, it comes to the attention of the court either that the patient is not complying with the order, or that the alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the patient's needs. Then the court may, after a hearing, consider other alternatives, modify the order, etc. So I just want to bring that to the committee's attention. Maybe even if, or just also Senator Sears as well, in case if anyone were to ask the question during the report. Where does that language come from? It's right out of the existing statute on uh, circumstances that are that can trigger in the in the case of the existing statute, the court uh, having to consider modifying the ONH um, or entering a new one. So it's not uh, it's not language that was made up out of nowhere. Um, okay. so before we go any further, uh, Peggy, could could you email us a copy of the bill? as past the committee? Uh, sure, I think I did, but I'll do it again. No problem. Well, if you could, please. Yeah, yeah no I don't, problem. I don't have one. No problem. I think Phil, Phil had a question first, but I have a question also. Go ahead, Alice. Okay. So I'm just wondering, in B, does this mean, in other words, what I'm wondering about is, could a, a private citizen bring enter get to the court to make a complaint? I mean, would they be allowed to make a file a complaint with the court in order to get some action going? Or does it have to be the state's attorney or someone official? Under this existing statute, I think it's phrased very broadly. It says, if at any time it comes to the court, to the attention of the court. So I don't think there's a limitation on how it can be brought to the court's attention. So there's certainly nothing prohibiting uh, yeah. a citizen from, uh, providing some sort of notice to the court that that's going on. Uh -huh, that's helpful. Yeah. Eric? Yes. My, I, I see that you're <laughs> paralleling the language from, right. from this. I'm wondering, uh, not complying is one thing, not adequate is another, and not available is a third. Um, does, does the court <clears throat> tend to read adequate as including not available? So in other words, Let's let's say that someone was assigned a treatment, and then, as has happened many times in the past, turns out not to be available. It it's not really accurate to say that they're not complying, and it's not accurate to say that it's not adequate because if they were able to take it, it might be adequate. Um, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um... So, I, I was going to suggest in the other language that we say adequate or available, um, but that obviously breaks with you're trying to use the exact language from the statute. Yeah, um, and and the only uh, point about that I would flag is that not that you couldn't make the parallel change elsewhere is that is that the underlying not the not even the existing statute but the bill the underlying full version of S3, yep. this tracks that language. I so see. you'd want to make, if you did want to make that change, which you certainly could, you'd want to have that other amendment made to the bill also. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that a court would treat adequate as including available. So, so in other words, if they were confronted with, um, with someone who had been ordered an alternative treatment, and then that treatment proved unavailable, then 
adequate would not adequate would describe that. And is that right? Yeah, I would read it that way. And and that okay. uh, you know that there's uh, uh, an alternative treatment that is unavailable. It's almost by definition inadequate, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Can I pull the language down, Senator Sears? We want to keep looking. Yeah. At no, it? that's fine. Um, yeah. I'm trying to. Uh, so, what are people? It doesn't take anything out. Is that correct? It just puts this in. No, it just puts this in. I'm trying. I just found my copy of the bill. A copy of the bill. Oh, Thank good. you, Peggy. I did find it. Yeah, and I just resent it to everyone. But it it's um, it's in section six of the working group, um, and it just adds to be the working group on the forensic care working group. We'll look at good idea. Anybody with a problem of offering this before third reading? Great. So I have a, I, I have a the proofed and edited copy of the amendment center series. The one I first sent you was still with the editors, but they okay. they finished with it. So I'll send you the final copy right now. Okay. There's a possibility that um, I won't be reporting S three today. I have to take my wife for her second COVID shot at twelve three at twelve fifteen. So if I don't know what the what the floor will look like today and when we get to it, so we may have to pass over S three. If we do, then I would offer an amendment on on Tuesday. So if I send it to you and Peggy, you can send it to John Bloomer. Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think Peggy does it, and then she sends it to John and them, and then I have to send it to them saying I'm okay with it. Oh, okay. Something like that. It's really convoluted, but it's. Yeah. <laughs> so this is different than something we're voting out, right? Yes. Well, it's an amendment from me, but I'm going to be mm -hmm. able to say that the committee supports the amendment. Okay. I'll send it to him and CC you on it. Just, I don't want to get in trouble with John Bloom. <laughs> No, but wait until Eric sends you the yep. the edited copy, right? Yep. Yes, we'll do. All right. Hey, good week, folks. Um, tough week. Tough yesterday on the floor with S thirty, but um, it's not often our committee is divided. But everybody did a good job, um, and we're all were respectful.